Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinkers series proudly presents the Origins Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. Welcome to the Origin Science Scholars Program, a series of talks on current research topics in origin sciences. Hello, my name is Glenn Starkman, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Case Western Reserve University and Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I am pleased to serve as your host for this series. The talk you're about to watch is entitled, From Nothing to Something. In this talk, I will tell you about how the universe went from being empty and boring to a place in which gravity is dragging together the future stars and galaxies. Please enjoy the talk. Tonight's topic is, actually tonight's topic is not from nothing to everything. This is the, the, top, the, the title of the three-part series, and I'm gonna tell you about the first part of it, and Chris Mijos, who's sitting there in the middle, will tell you about the second and third parts. My topic is from nothing to something. And he's going to take us from something to everything, namely from something to galaxies and from galaxies to stars and planets. But tonight I want to talk about how we get from nothing to something. So I'll start by telling you about the empty universe, how we get a clean slate from a messy one, and then we'll go on to talk about quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanics makes almost nothing from nothing. And finally, we'll talk about how gravity manages to grow something from almost nothing. So let's get started. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to go from a very smooth universe that looks something like this to a universe that's not quite so smooth, that looks something like this but ultimately evolves into something that looks more like the real universe that we see out there. And this is the Hubble ultra deep field. This is what the universe looks like if we look out as deep as we can. It contains all sorts of galaxies. Uh, I think there's uh, young galaxies, old galaxies. We're looking through at the universe out to a very large distance there. Okay. So how did we get everything well, this is only something. The everythings are sitting inside that, the, the planets and the stars and, and uh, the people on those other planets or the, the, the intelligent beings, maybe. But how did we get something like this from a universe that was born looking nothing like this? And the question we should first start with is, what do we expect of an infant universe? And what we really expect of an infant universe is something that looks kind of like this crushed up piece of paper. So what do I mean by that? And, and I've shown you there what crushed up piece of paper looks like smoothed out a little bit. What I mean by that is it's highly disorganized. It has no, um, no regular structure. It doesn't look at all smooth. It's kind of random. I would use the word chaotic, but my friends who actually study chaos would tell me that chaos is actually very organized. Okay? So our common use of the word chaos is not the same as the technical one. So I'll use the word messy. Okay. The universe should look very messy initially. It should look uneven, uncorrelated, meaning what goes on here is different than what goes on there, unconnected. Why? Because the early universe had no opportunity to get any, be anything but uncorrelated. It had no opportunity for the different parts of it to get to know each other, evolve so that it became all looking alike. We only expect large, objects or large regions to become smooth and homogeneous if they have time to talk with, the different parts have time to talk with one another and become smooth. So when we look out at the earliest universe, part of the universe, at the most distant places that we look, can look out to, do we see something that looks like a crushed up piece of paper, something bumpy and random and messy? Well, how do we look, with, look out there? We look with giant microwave antennas, like this one, this is the original one that we looked out with, and what we saw was something that looked like this. Very, very smooth. What we saw is a glow coming from the entire universe, every direction, that was essentially the same to a few parts in 100,000 
in every direction that we looked. Okay. So nothing like the absolutely messy universe that we thought we'd see. Instead, what we got was something smooth and highly correlated. In other words, if I look out in this direction and measure the temperature of the universe out in that direction, that tells me what the temperature is out in that direction, direction to within a few millionths of a degree. That was very surprising. And you could ask, well, how did the universe get this smooth? That's one of the most important questions we ask. Well, we, we struggled with this question for a long time to understand how different parts of a universe that could have had no chance to interact with each other could possibly become so homogeneous and so identical. And here's a picture of what we think goes, goes on. We think that the universe basically grows very, very quickly. So if this circle represents the distance out to which light travels in, a, in the early part of the universe, the universe manages, and let me run this by you again, the universe managed to, manages to expand in such a way that it is growing out past that. In other words, it's expanding faster than the speed of light. So places are moving apart from each other faster than the speed of light. And that process, what it does is it basically takes the universe and it smooths it out. It stretches it out so that it's nice and smooth. Okay. Much smoother than this piece of paper. Incredibly smooth. We call this process inflation and it leaves behind a universe that is nearly empty because it's been stretched so much that all the things were in it are now very far apart from one another, one another and very, very, very smooth. So somehow the universe ends up giving us something very different than what we thought it would start with. Namely, it gives us essentially a blank slate. Okay. Now you might ask, what could possibly drive this process of expanding faster than the speed of light? Okay. And our best answer to that, and you've heard, some of you have heard me say this before, is that what we think does this is nothing. Okay. What do I mean by nothing? I mean that what does it is the energy of empty space. What we would tend to call, what we would tend to call the vacuum. Now you might say, well, if it's the vacuum and it's empty, what do you mean by the energy of empty space? And the thing is, the important word to understand here is the word empty, which is of course why I put it in quotation marks. When I say empty, what I mean is that it is empty of particles. Okay. In other words, we've taken out of that space, not, there are no atoms in that space, there are no protons, there are no neutrons, there are no quarks, that's empty space. But it may not be empty of fields like the electric field or the magnetic field. So for example, if we took a box and took all of the stuff we could out of it, we could still put a plate on top of it with lots of positive charges and a plate below it with lots of negative charges. And then we would get an electric field going through that empty box. We would still say the box is empty. Now we don't think that what is was pervading the space early, space early in its history was an electric field or a magnetic field, but some other field. <coughs> so the important thing about the energy of fields is that they behave very differently than the energy of particles. In what sense? Well, if I take a box that has particles in it, then as I expand the space, I have the same number of particles. So take a box, put some apples in it. Instead of apples, you could put hydrogen atoms or protons or any other particle. Expand the box. Now go and look in the box. You'll have the same number of particles that you started with. But space is different because if I take a box and fill it with space and expand the box and look inside, then I have a lot more space. Now, that doesn't matter very much if space has no energy, but if space actually has energy associated with it, that means that as I expand the box, I actually get more energy. So what we say is that as space expands, we get more vacuum and therefore more vacuum energy. So kind of like this, here's a box. If I let the box expand, 
I get a bigger box. And what that means is that if there's a certain amount of energy associated with the space inside this box, then as the box expands, I now have more energy associated with that box. So if space started out empty but full of a field that gave energy to, to space, then that, sp that field would, the energy in that field would grow as the space grew. That's very different than any other form of energy. And it, it turns out that according to the laws of general relativity, if you fill a box with a field and nothing else, and there's energy associated with that field, then this process of as the universe, exp the box expands, as space expands, you get more energy. That energy then drives more expansion. That expansion creates more energy. This runaway process gives us exponential expansion and places start to move apart faster than the speed of light and we call this process inflation. We also don't know what that field is that is responsible for inflation. It's not the electric field or the magnetic field. It's also none of the fields that we know are associated with ordinary particles. There are other fields, the, the field of the Higgs particle, for example that they're looking for at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. So for the moment, we just call it the inflaton, meaning the field that drives inflation. And we've been trying to figure out precisely what that field is, and we don't know yet. So this is an open question in current research in particle physics and in fundamental physics. Now you might say, this is a crazy idea. It is. And when this idea was introduced in the 1980s, people said, oh, that can't possibly be true. You better predict some things. And of course, that's the beauty of science. If you have a crazy idea, it better make predictions in order to be science, and then you have to go out and test them. And this idea of an exponential inflation, uh, expansion and inflation has many different predictions. So far, none of those predictions have turned out to be wrong. So, so f and no other theory has managed, no one has managed to write down another theory which makes all the same set of predictions. So as far as we can tell, this is our best theory to explain how the universe got so smooth, so empty, so old, and as I'll tell you in a, few, a little while, how it managed to produce the little amount of structure that we actually see, rather than the huge amounts of structure that we would have gotten from that terribly messy universe like this. Because if the universe had really started off messy like this, then all those little wrinkles would have turned into black holes and other awful things, and we wouldn't have been able to be here, sitting here talking about it in a universe that started out like that. We needed a universe that started off reasonably smooth in order to then grow the type of universe that we see around us in which we have galaxies that are um, big enough but not so big, dense enough but not too dense, not too far apart, not too close together, and certainly not dominated by huge black holes and nothing else. So, we've just talked about the empty universe and how we get a clean slate from the messy one that we thought we'd start with, and so this is a good time for us to go to questions. Glenn, could we make an assumption here or try to make an assumption that I could try to tie dark energy in with the inflaton. It turns out that if we look to today, we discover that the universe is once again accelerating and expanding in a very similar way to the way we, we believe that it accelerated, uh, expanded early in the universe. So we believe that early in the history of the universe, there's this process of inflation, and the universe was expanding at a rate that was exponential, which meant that Places that were close together started moving apart faster and faster and faster until they were moving apart faster than the speed of light. And we see that going on again today. Okay? Now, we don't believe that the root cause of it is the same field. And the reason is that this was happening, when this was happening in the early universe, it actually was happening much, much more quickly than it's happening now. 
Okay. So what we, what we tend to believe is that there was some field, let's call it, we call it the inflaton that was responsible for it back then, but that this is a relatively generic thing that happens as universe, as a generic universe evolves. So I can, if I can imagine setting up all sorts of experimental universes, imagine that I could do that. In my laboratory, I build little baby universes and set them off and watch them. That typically they go through periods of inflation like this. The period of inflation early in the universe we think is more generic than the one that's going on now though. The one that's going on now is a little bit odd. Inflation typically happens much, much more quickly than we're seeing. In fact, one of the big mysteries is why did our universe wait so long to start inflating again? Typically universes inflate within a very small fraction of, the, of a second after the, after the Big Bang, after the initial start of the universe. They start inflating and they never stop. Our universe has managed to survive for about 10 billion years before it started to inflate again. And that's a good thing for us because if it inflated really, really quickly again at the beginning, then we wouldn't be here. It would rip apart atom. It would have ripped apart all the atoms, or if not the atoms, then it would have ripped apart the molecules, or if not the molecules, it would have ripped apart the stars before they formed, or the galaxies. So, um, so same phenomena going on, possibly the, sa uh, the same cause, but probably due to a different source of dark energy. Same, but very similar. Very, very, that's a great connection. If inflation is continuing now, does that mean the planets in our solar system are expanding away from each other also? Uh, the answer is, well, I looked, I went out this morning, I looked, I saw the sun. It wasn't moving away from us. Why not? Well, because the gravity of the sun ties the earth to it strong, with enough strength, with enough force, that the earth can't be pulled away by the expansion of the universe. In fact, our galaxy is not being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe. In fact, our local group of galaxies, us and Andromeda and, you know, dozens of others is not being pulled apart by the expansion of the universe. However, our local supercluster, so our local group plus uh, lots of other clusters that make up something called the Virgo supercluster, may well get pulled apart over the next 10 to 50 billion years. It's kind of marginal. Bigger things will get pulled apart unless this expansion changes. Now, some of you may have heard of something called the Big Rip. It kind of enters the popular science literature once in a while. The big rip is the idea that this, this, ex this expansion is not only accelerating, but the acceleration is accelerating. In that case, first the superclusters get pulled apart, then the expansion speeds up even more and the clusters get pulled apart, then the galaxies get pulled apart, then the solar systems get, the stellar systems get pulled apart, the planetary systems. Then the stars get pulled apart, the planets get pulled apart, finally the atoms get pulled apart, the protons and neutrons get pulled apart. And eventually, essentially space itself gets pulled apart. That's called the big rip. But that's not the generic thing that seems to happen. The generic thing that seems to happen is that the acceleration goes on at the same rate constantly. And we, in 30 billion years to 50 billion years, will look out at a universe that contains nothing other than Maybe our local supercluster, but probably just our local group. Everything else will have been pulled apart and we will no longer see it and we'll live in a very different looking universe and come to very different conclusions about the universe if we're cosmologists looking out at it than we do today. As I try to wrap my mind around this, um, I, I, I start thinking of this, uh, the universe as a relative vacuum that is exploding into an absolute vacuum. The question of whether the universe is expanding into anything or, not, or just expanding itself depends enormously on parts of the, our model of physics that we have at this point no experimental tests of. So it is possible that what we call the universe, the places that have all the same physics properties, scientific you know, properties of the fundamental laws of physics that we see around us, extends only for a finite distance. So if I go far enough that something's going to change. On the other hand, it's possible that they, that extends out to infinity. Or it's possible that if, if I go far enough, I'll come back to myself and the whole universe is only finite. All of these are possibilities and we don't know at this point which one is correct. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching the Origin Science Scholars presentation entitled 
from nothing to something. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins. In the first part of my talk, I discussed how the universe starts out messy and bumpy. Then, through a period of ultra-rapid expansion called inflation, the universe is stretched and smoothed into a place where the future galaxies can safely grow. In the next part of my talk, I will describe how, through the magic of quantum mechanics, the vibrations of empty space create the first seeds of those future galaxies. Now we return to the lecture. Because we're ready to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanics makes almost nothing from nothing. So remember, we started, it seemed, with this incredibly empty universe, or we, fit, we started with a very messy universe, but inflation has turned this universe into something that's very empty. And when we look out, we see a universe in which at least, although it's not empty, it's the same in every direction. So we're gonna have to figure out how we got from not having anything, an empty universe, to having something, a universe full of radiation that we can see, and how that radiation turned out to be not precisely smooth, because that not precisely smooth is gonna turn out to turn into everything of interest like us. So let's start though with what is quantum mechanics? And I could try to give you a lesson on quantum mechanics standing on one leg. You probably wouldn't understand it. I probably wouldn't understand it either. Uh, if you'd like, you can go here. We had a series of lectures last spring on, on quantum mechanics. Let me tell you a little bit about quantum mechanics though, which is that is approximately the study of how very small things behave. Because very small things and by very small, I generally mean much smaller than anything that you and I look at in our everyday lives, behave differently than big things like us. Okay? And you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with the universe? Because the universe is, after all, a very big thing. Well, this is a big thing, the universe that we look at and see but I'd like to show you how big the universe was, this whole thing that we see at the end of inflation. About that big, about a centimeter, that's all. So everything that we see at the end of inflation was probably about this big. There may be things beyond that, but the region of the universe that we see was quite small. And I just told you that inflation was a period when the universe was expanding at an exponential rate, and that means that before inflation, the universe was even smaller, uh, much smaller than this dot. Um, in fact, much smaller than an atom. Uh, actually, much smaller than the nucleus of an atom, or even than the individual protons at the center of the atom. It was very, very, very small. And so, describing the behavior of that region that eventually evolved into our universe, we need to use quantum mechanics. Now here's the only important thing we need to know about quantum mechanics today, and that is that quantum mechanics tells us that the energy of something can change, as long as it does it for brief periods. So we think of, if I, something has a certain amount of energy, it's stuck with it. But in fact, the energy of, of an object that's small enough can change for a brief amount of time. The, the shorter the time it changes for, the more, can, the more energy it can change. So that br very small spot that represents a hugely expanded view of our universe is subject to quantum mechanics, and that means that its energy can change. Can everyone see that? Its energy is changing, its color is changing, that's hard to see, so let me blow it up. We can think of it like this. Its, its energy is fluctuating with time around some average value. And that means that our standard picture of the vacuum, which is kind of like that, really interesting. If you stare at that for a while, you'll see nothing interesting happening. That is not the best picture of vacuum because what we're not talking about is our grandmother's vacuum. Right? We're not talking about something that just pulls, that we've pulled all the particles out of, out of that region of space. We're talking about something far more interesting. 
we're talking about the quantum vacuum. Okay? And the quantum vacuum, well, our first pass of looking at it, it might look kind of more like this, kind of speckled. So there are regions with a little bit more energy and a little bit less energy. And that comes about because what's really going on is that particles are appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing all over the place. Right? In fact, it's happening right before you. You don't see it, but even the hydrogen atoms in your body notice it. They notice that in the space between the electron that's running around the nucleus and the nucleus, there are particles appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing very quickly, and that changes the orbits of the electrons. And that happens in empty space. So the picture of the vacuum shouldn't be really like this, it should be kind of more like this. That's a better picture of what's going on in the vacuum. It doesn't look like a vacuum to us. That's not what we think of as a vacuum, but we have evidence that that really is what the vacuum looks like. Okay, so now let's go and try to understand inflation in that context. So this is just kind of a little sketch in which we imagine that there's some vacuum energy that's meant to be a high place and eventually we're gonna to get to a play, uh, some in the future, we're gonna to get to a period when there's not very much vacuum energy. And how does that happen? Well, this field called the infoton slowly changes its vacuum energy. Its vacuum, it, it rolls down this kind of hill. Okay? And eventually it tumbles over the edge of, of kind of like a waterfall and releases all of its energy. And that's good because all of those particles that it released, those are photons and electrons and quarks that go into making up protons, that's the stuff that we're gonna get made of. Okay? So we had all this energy stored up in the vacuum that was causing the universe to expand at an accelerating rate, and then at some point, that energy got released. Something happened to the vacuum that I'm just showing you here schematically, where the vacuum, which started up here, released its energy, and in doing so, emitted all that energy in the form of ordinary particles. And that's really kind of the beginning of the Big Bang. It's that point that we really start time at. We say, okay, now the universe is full of all these particles, and now we can look at how it evolves, and guess what, we'll watch it, and it'll start making, the quarks will start coming together to make nuclei, and then they're gonna make atoms, and then the atoms are gonna make galaxies, and the galaxies are gonna have stars inside of them, and all the interesting stuff that we're gonna tell you over the next a few weeks. So when we look out at the universe with, with microwave antennas like this one and see that the universe is smooth, what we're seeing is the stuff that got created over there from the inflaton giving up its energy and over there from the inflaton giving up its energy. And because the inflaton had managed to smooth out the universe so well, make the properties the same in every direction, the amount of energy that it gave up in every direction was pretty much the same. And that's why the universe looks so smooth. And we're seeing, when we look out, the particles that were made when this inflaton, this field that we've just made up, we don't know what it is, we, that, it made, that it emitted when it gave up its energy. But the story I just told you didn't include the quantum mechanics of what happens to the inflaton as it rolls down as it slowly, first slowly and then quickly gives up its energy. Because I really should have showed you a picture that looks more like this, where the inflaton kind of goes down and then it jumps back up and it does all sorts of strange things that ordinary classical particles wouldn't do rolling down a hill, but that quantum mechanical particles can do. So let's just watch that again. It's rolling down, but instead of keeping rolling down, it kind of jumps up occasionally, you know, stops, jumps up, jumps up, and then eventually it tumbles down and releases its energy into ordinary particles. Now those fluctuations, those little, those little jumpings are random. That means they vary from place to place. They're different here than they are there. Okay. Kind of like a roulette wheel. So the roulette wheel is the same, but every time you spin it, you get a different number. And if you don't, you know that there's something wrong with the roulette wheel. Okay. So the roulette wheel is this physics of this inflaton, and the spins are 
what you get from this place versus what you get from this place. So each spin is going to be a little bit different. And so it's like a game of roulette where the wheel doesn't change, but the spins are different each time. So let me show you two different spins of the roulette wheel. What happens over there, say, and over there. So the fluctuations are a little bit different. So that one ended up falling down the hill a little bit later. So we have this period of expansion driven by the inflaton where it smooths out the whole universe, but when it ends is a little bit different over there than over there. And that means that the amount of energy is a little bit different over there and over there when we, when we go and look at it. So now we go and look not with that horn that I, I showed you, but we go ahead and look with a satellite, like say the uh, Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, which is a satellite sitting out one and a half million kilometers, about a million miles, further out from the, the sun than the Earth, and it looks out at the universe, and it sees slightly different temperatures in every direction. It makes a map that looks like this. Okay. And what is this map? Now we can understand it. This map is a map of the small differences in the amount of vacuum energy that got turned into ordinary particles, okay? So indeed, the temperature in that direction and the temperature in that direction are almost exactly alike. In fact, it's just under three degrees above absolute zero no matter which direction we look today. Okay? And it took us from the late 1960s until the early 1990s to be able to see any significant difference between the temperatures in different directions because it's only a few millionths of a degree different, only a few millionths of a degree cooler in this direction than it is in direction, this direction. So this is a map, this is like a globe, uh, like I peeled off a globe and I've made a map of the sky. Here, this is, this is towards the center of the galaxy, it's a little bit cooler on the sky that way. Here's some other direction, it's a little bit warmer in that direction. How much warmer? Just a few millionths of a degree. So what have we done? We started with a universe that was very, very messy. Really, really messy. Not at the messy at this level, but um, messy at the level where there, there would have been differences of many, many degrees today in different directions. If we had started with that universe, we would have ended up with a mess, something that looks nothing like the universe we see today. But this inflaton, this field, that we're still trying to figure out what it is, caused the universe to expand at an exponential rate and smoothed it out, emptied it out, and then that field started to give up its energy. After some period of time, in fact, we don't know how long it took before it gave up its energy. It might have been a few seconds. It might have been a few years. It might have been such a, a period that's much, much longer than what we call the age of the universe, 13 billion years. But at the time when it finally did, it did it at a little bit different rate in different places, a tiny different rate. Enough, though, that we can today measure the difference between how much energy was released over there and how much energy was released over there. Okay? That little bit of difference we call the fluctuations of the microwave background radiation. So this is the energy, the light coming from the earliest history of the universe. This light that, that I'm mapping here was released when the universe was just 300,000 years after the end of inflation. People will say after the Big Bang. What they really mean is after the end of inflation, after 300,000 years, this light no longer was bouncing around the universe. The universe became transparent. Until the, then, the universe was opaque. So after 300,000 years, the universe became transparent enough for that light to start traveling freely through the universe. We look out, we get that light, and we notice these incredibly tiny differences, a few parts in 100,000 between different directions. So we've gone from actually a mess to nothing to now just almost nothing. Very confusing. We have, we have uh, energy, which is supposedly doesn't have any mass to it. Energy can be associated with mass or not associated with mass. Well, and that's, that's my question, because when, when that pill ran down the hill, all right, all of a sudden we had the release of particles, which would suggest that there's matter in 
uh, the inflaton. So there's energy associated with the inflaton. So the question was, how, what is the nature of this energy that's being released by the inflaton? So this inflaton is storing up lots and lots of energy, just as if, if I, for example, put a magnetic field in, a, in space. There's energy associated with that magnetic field, even though I don't see any particles running around. If I have an electric field, okay, such as I would get between the ends of a battery, there's energy associated just with that electric field, even in the absence of any particles living there. The same thing is true of this field called the inflaton. There's energy associated with it just being there. And then what happens is the inflaton, its properties are changing with time, and one day it wakes up and realizes that it needs to decay away. It needs to give up all its energy. And when it gives up its energy, it produces ordinary particles, just regular particles. Okay. Right, just the, this stuff as well as particles of light and, and all sorts of other particles. And th this is, you know, so all of that energy was stored in one form, the inflaton, and is then, then is released into a completely different form, namely light and ordinary particles. Glenn Einstein once rhetorically asked whether the moon was still there when you weren't looking. And the question had something to do with quantum mechanics and the collapse of a wave function. So presumably when the universe was really tiny, there was a continuously evolving wave function. But then 300,000 years later, you had inequivalent reductions of this wave function collapsing at a different temperature here and there. What, what introduced the decoherence? The answer to that, unfortunately, is rather technical. <laughs> and, and so I don't think I'm gonna elucidate anything by, by, by explaining things here, let me just say that as things get bigger, as things expand exponentially and move apart faster than the speed of light, once they're out of contact, essentially quantum mechanics no longer applies in the, in the way that we would normally have. But that process of where quantum mechanics, things that are quantum mechanical become classical, non-quantum mechanical, is very interesting and I would say not completely understood in this context, even though we use it. You said the inflaton is a crazy idea, but it's led to many predictions, and none of them have yet been disproved. What are some of those? What are some of the predictions? So one of the predictions um, is, so the predictions mostly have to do, let me, with the precise nature of this map okay, and of, of other things that derive from that map. So the statistical properties of, of this map, okay. So for example, if I look carefully at this map, I would see that there are correlations between places that are relatively far apart. What does that mean? I can think of this map, if you like, as an imprint of the sound waves that were traveling through the universe after inflation. So inflation, those, those fluctuations, you can think of them as driving sound waves in the universe. That's exactly what they did. They excited sound in the universe. Now, if inflation hadn't happened, then the largest sound waves that should have ever been excited should have been about the size of one of these little blobs that you see. Okay. It turns out that when we look at this map, it also contains much lower sounds, much longer wavelength sounds. The only way we know to produce such long wavelength sounds, in particular with the properties that they have, is through inflation. So far, that's the only way we know. Um, that's probably the most, the most easy to explain uh, um, and, and most important prediction. There are, other, some, there are some other detailed predictions about precisely how one degree size fluctuations and say a tenth of a degree size fluctuations compare in, in, in volume. So how the different, if, if you want to think of this, it turns out that this can be thought of as a musical score, okay? It, it tells us different, that there's all sorts of different notes being played. It doesn't look like a musical score. It's a two dimensional musical score. Okay. And the notes being played have, have volumes, different volumes. And we can ask, well, inflation tells us what volume every note should be played with. It turns out that for all but the lowest notes, inflation gets this exactly right so far. 
and no other theory we know gets this exactly right. It also turns out it doesn't get the lowest notes right. That's something that I'm, inter I'm personally interested in. But for everything except the very lowest notes, it gets them surprisingly right. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program presentation. In the second part of my talk, I described how quantum mechanics creates small concentrations of energy in an otherwise empty universe. In the final portion of the presentation, we will explore how gravity turns those seeds into galaxies like our Milky Way. Now, back to the program. Our last 15 minutes, we're going to spend answering the question, how do we get from those very, very small fluctuations into something that's relevant for everyday life? How do we get from these very, very tiny fluctuations to something real? And the answer is that it's going to be gravity that makes something from almost nothing. So let's look at this map again. So remember, this is a map that shows us places that are a little less energetic. It turns out this actually means this is a region that's a little denser than the region around it. The blue areas are a little bit denser than the yellow and green areas. And so if I you know, focus in on that, I see dense regions surrounded by not so dense regions. And the question is, what happens when you start with some dense regions and some not so dense regions around them? Now, the difference in densities here are tiny, very tiny. Nevertheless, those denser regions have more mass in them than the regions around them. More mass means that the pull of gravity is stronger. Okay. So what's going to go on then is a tug of war okay. with the more dense regions pulling harder than the less dense regions. So if over here is lots of mass pulling really hard and here's less mass trying to pull as hard but not succeeding, then what's going to happen is that the denser regions are slowly going to gain mass. They're going to pull in stuff from around them more than, they, than that gets pulled away. Okay. So we have this tug of war going on between the denser regions and the less dense regions. And this is going to lead to the slow growth in structure. So we have a dense region surrounded by less dense region. The stuff from the matter in the less dense region is going to slowly migrate into the denser region. And that means that the denser region is going to become even denser than the surrounding area. Okay. So we're going to have a slow accumulation of matter in those regions that started off just a little bit denser, so that we kind of become much denser and, and finally really dense. Now the question is, which structures grow first? Because remember that map had small fluctuations and big fluctuations. Do we end up growing really big things first? That would be called what we call a top-down scenario. So maybe we build really big things, and those really big things fragment into smaller things. So maybe we build clusters of galaxies, and those fragment into galaxies that fragment into stars. Or do we build really small things up? You know, small things first, and then we assemble them into larger things. That's called a bottom-up scenario. Okay. Well, we can answer this by realizing that what's going on here is actually a Goldilocks story. You remember the story of Goldilocks with the three bears. And it'll turn out that we want things that are, the things that are not, that are too big, they're not going to grow very well. The things that are too small, they're not going to grow very well either. It's the things that are just right that are going to grow. So what do I mean by too big? Well, suppose I have some region, this, this gray region, that has a little bit more density than the surrounding region. Okay. And I've drawn this blue circle. And that blue circle is the distance out to w uh, across which light has been able to travel in the history of the universe. Well, if it's the distance that light has been able to cross in the history of the universe, it's also the distance that gravity has been able to cross in the history of the universe, because gravity doesn't travel faster than the speed of light. And that means that gravity can't really pull things in from the outside very efficiently, because gravity hasn't been able to cross a large enough distance. Gravity could only kind of work at the margins of this, of this region. 
This region is too big to grow. It's too big to attract stuff at any reasonable rate. So that tells us that regions can't grow if they're too big for gravity to cross in the history of the universe. So too big isn't good. Okay. It's kind of like trying to get stuff from one side of the river to the other side of the river over a bridge that doesn't go all the way over. So the, the one side of the river is the less dense stuff. We're trying to move that over into the denser region on the other side, but the bridge doesn't cross the whole river. They've only started building the bridge. We're not gonna be able to get it across until the entire bridge is built. And it's gonna take time for that entire bridge to be built. It's gonna take us until the light, the gravity has had a time to move all the way out to here. So really big things, things that are too big, can't grow. Now it's with time, the size of the region that gravity affects grows. You can think of it as building that bridge. You have to build a bridge one piece at a time. You can build a small bridge more quickly than you can build a long bridge. So eventually, the region that we can, that gravity affects is going to be big enough that an overdense region this size can grow. Gravity is gonna start pulling in stuff from outside, okay? So it's as if we had a bridge now extending over the entire river. We can move things from the less dense side over to the dense side. We can bring things from the surroundings into the denser region. Okay, so suppose we have a region that now is small enough that gravity can act over all of it and so start bringing things in from the outside in. Will it? Because there are comp competing things going on. It's true that gravity, shown here with the red arrows, is trying to pull things in, but in the meantime, you have all these very, very high energy particles that are trying to get out. They're just running around at the speed of light and there are more of them in here than there are out there. So if we build up a little bit of extra energy in here, they start to diffuse or to just stream out of our region. So we have a competition here between gravity pulling things in and the things that have been pulled in saying, wait, I don't wanna be here, I'm just as happy to be over there. So we pull stuff in and it starts to just stream out. It's kind of like a leaky box. There's no walls around here keeping stuff in. We're pulling stuff into a, into a region that doesn't have any walls on it, so it'll just leave. Well, here's where we come back to our Goldilocks story, because if the region is too small, then indeed stuff just manages to leak out. So two small regions, they get diluted away. We try to build up small things the size of, say, stars in the early universe. If we tried to build something the size of a star, gravity would start to pull stuff into this dense region the size of a star, but the stuff would just leak right back out. So small concentrations of mass get diluted as photons and neutrinos, these are particles that travel very quickly, just stream out faster than gravity can pull them in. Okay. But there are things in the middle that are just right. They're small enough that gravity has, has acted over a region bigger than them, so gravity can pull stuff into them. On the other hand, they're big enough that stuff streaming out doesn't leak out faster than gravity pulls stuff in. Okay. And so larger, dense regions pull matter in too fast for this diffusion or the streaming to erase the growth. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that we're gonna get a whole spectrum of fluctuations. We're gonna get some things that are, the things that are really, really big, they're gonna have a hard time growing. So we're not gonna get really, really big structures at first. The things that are really small, they can't hold on to their extra mass, so the mass just streams out. They're not gonna grow at the beginning. Instead, we're gonna get things that are just right. So the two big things, they can't grow, at least not until later. The two small regions, they're very small, much smaller than a galaxy, and they don't grow until much later either, and in a different way. The things that are just right, sort of the size of a galaxy, they grow first. And since they grow first, they're gonna grow the most. And the larger regions, they have to wait a little longer, eventually they start growing, 
clusters grow after galaxies, superclusters grow after clusters. So they eventually become just right and grow. Now, someone asked me earlier about dark energy. So we look out today and we see that once again, the universe is starting to grow at a rate fast that is accelerating. And that means that once again, regions are starting to move apart faster than the speed of light. And that means that really big places are never going to become just right. We're never going to get super, super clusters. So we have galaxies, like our Milky Way. They're grouped into clusters of galaxies. Those are out there, there's lots of them. Those, those clusters of galaxies are grouped into super clusters. They've just started to form kind of over the last few billion years. There are no super, 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 super clusters. And if there are, they're gonna get ripped apart over the next few billion years. Okay. They will never become just right. The spectrum of things that we've seen is all that there is to see. So, we've started from a universe that looked like this crunkled up paper bag, maybe smoothed out a little, and that's its question itself, what smoothed it out in the beginning. But inflation took us to something that looked incredibly smooth, something that when we look out with our microwave antennas, we see the same thing in every direction to within a few parts in 100,000. But when we look more closely, then through the wonders of quantum mechanics, we discover that that very smooth region isn't precisely smooth because of small changes in the amount of energy in each in different places caused by quantum mechanical fluctuations in this thing called the inflaton. By the action of gravity, that's allowed us almost to get to here. Well, it will allow us to get to here, except to hear about that, you're gonna have to wait till next week because we've come to the end of today's lecture in which we've learned how we get from a clean slate, a clean slate from a messy one, how we get almost nothing from nothing, and finally how gravity grows something from almost nothing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> this lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It has been brought to you with the generous support of Richard Morrison and the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Media Vision, and WVIZ PBS and 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at www.case.edu forward slash origins.